go. Now we're up and running. Now you're like big. You're on the big screen. Oh, great. <laughs> um. So welcome to your own podcast. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Um, roles are reversed. The roles are reversed a little bit. And, you know, when I saw you in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago, I was so impressed, obviously, listening to you talk about the podcast to everybody that walked by us. So it was nice to hear sort of the background of your story. And mm-hmm. I think that's when we looked at each other and said, wait, why don't I interview you <laughs> on the podcast? Um, so here we are. Yeah. So how many seasons are you in? How deep are you in the podcast? Uh, we are three seasons in right now. So we are in the middle of our third season and we're almost fully booked for our fourth season next year. So that's really exciting. Did you have any idea that um, this podcast would be so, one, easy to book for and so successful? No, no. Um when I first started it, I really was just expecting to do maybe one or two seasons and just try to bridge that gap of communication in the brain cancer, grief and loss space. Um, I figured nobody else is doing this out of all the podcasts that are out there. There's nobody kind of storytelling in this way right now. And so if I'll do a season or two and figure out what my life plan is going to be, and maybe this will help me heal. And it just exploded at the end of the first season. And we knew we had something. And my producer was kind of looked at me and said, we got to keep going with this. And we started getting sponsors and we were reaching more and more communities and more and more people nationally and globally. And the next thing I knew, we were rolling out our third season. And it's it's interesting, you know, with booking guests, we have we have some really colorful and creative guests that come on throughout each of the seasons. It isn't hard to book for, which is great, but it's also very telling because it means that there are just that many stories out there to be told in this space. And that breaks my heart a little bit. I would almost rather have trouble finding people to come on and talk about brain cancer. The fact that there are so many people is, it says a lot. Um, about what's going on out there. So I know this is a difficult time of of year for you. Um, And I guess it was three years ago about that you lost your husband to glioblastoma. And I know having that experience obviously really um, allows you to feel the pain of caregiving and um, of course being a patient uh, with, with glioblastoma you just remind us of some of your personal trauma and Mm -hmm. what you went through? (laughs) Excuse me. Sure. Um, Yeah. Yeah. This time of year is really, really hard. Um, Mike, my late husband died. It'll be three years ago next month at the end of October. And um, he died from glioblastoma. He only made it about 14 months start to finish. He was 45 when he died. And uh, the experience was really, actually, there's an experience that I just went through. Um, I recently injured my back really, really badly and um, have been in a tremendous amount of pain in the last few days. And the doctor said, I'm going to put you on a very short course of steroids. And that entire experience, like me not being able to walk, um, needing assistance, getting up uh, temporarily, the doctor wanting to put me on steroids, all of that, it just, everything came flooding back when Mike was sick, um, especially towards the end, because that was exactly what he went through. He started losing his ability to walk and he couldn't care for himself when he was on steroids. Uh, it was a different steroid and I had to remind myself that, but it was not it was a dark period. It was a very hard time when he was on those. So it was, it was very interesting how much of that came screaming back to me during the course of going through this. And that's really what it is. I mean, when, when you're walking with somebody that's got glioblastoma or 
any brain cancer, really. I mean, it's, it's very traumatic. It's very, it's a very difficult journey. Um, you, the person that you've known for so long starts to shed away and they kind of become a shell of who they were. And that's really what that experience was like. It was, it was very hard to watch my husband who I had basically grown up with. I mean, I'd known him for 20 years and we had built this really amazing life together. And he was the greatest person in the entire world. Um, and to watch him really struggle with losing his ability to take care of himself, to, to think out problems and to problem solve, um, his ability to speak. I mean, it was just, it was heart wrenching. And I ended up having to make, we made all of the decisions together. And that was something that I carried with me into the podcast was really teaching other people how to advocate for themselves. Um, and we did that as a team. And then when he lost his ability to really do that for himself, I had to shoulder that for him. And it taught me a lot about getting people to listen to you. I mean, it's, you really become kind of a ghost, you know, everybody's making, you know, all the doctors and everybody's making decisions. And sometimes you're saying things and you wonder if anybody's really hearing what you're saying. Yeah. And that's what it felt like at times. And that, that was really hard for me. And I felt there were moments where I was like, okay, I need to stop my feet or put a sign up or something and say, Hey, you need to listen to me right now. Um, and that, and that's what it took. I mean, it's, it's a really hard journey. And unfortunately, for whatever reason, he only had 14 months, we really hoped he would be a, a four year, five year, six year survivor, we hoped he would have the time um, that I've seen with some of the other amazing patients and guests that I've met. But for whatever reason, he wasn't granted that time and um, lost his battle to it in October of 2020. And along with that, we um, we lost our adoption that we had been planning for for years um, after suffering some miscarriages. And I I'll be honest, I mean, I, I don't even know if I fully went through the grieving process of the miscarriages because by the time we got through those, we got picked for adoption. And so my head went right into, okay, let's just we're in go mode because at least we have the adoption now. And then we were planning for that. And we were only six weeks away from bringing her home when he got diagnosed and that got the adoption got taken away from us because of his diagnosis. And then he died. So I, I think like I had to prioritize and like, well, okay, I, I just lost him. I can't even think about yeah. all the other stuff that I just lost because I don't even know how to get through his loss yet. You know, you're making me emotional thinking about your struggles. Um, <laughs> and in the midst of the height of the pandemic, nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't imagine how I, I just think back to how tough it was for us um, as caregivers in October of 2020 and <clears throat> particularly in New York city for the six months prior to that. So yeah, I'm just in awe of your fortitude and strength. And um, it was difficult. It was definitely there were a lot of regulations. You know, he he spent the last six weeks at Roswell um, at, at one of the cancer centers up here. And um, and it was so tough because I had to move heaven and earth just to get like some of his family members who don't live here. They're, you know, two, three hours away. I had to talk to administration and like bend bend rules just to get them to be able to come out to see their son and their brother, you know, and then I had restrictions on how much time I could spend with him until the very end. And then all of a sudden, and every day it changed, you know, when the pandemic was doing better, the regulations got looser yeah. pandemic, you know, cases went back up all of a sudden, and you just couldn't keep up with it. And it just made it, it, it made it a really stressful, stressful time. Well, we struggled also, and in order to get our patients' families, and we were giving out iPads to communicate, and I was just mm -hmm. uh, in the operating room, and my scrub tech told me that he lost his father um, during the pandemic and, and wasn't able to see him because, you know, we had a rule in New York State, like many other states, mm -hmm. that the nursing homes had to take back our COVID patients. Yeah. And 
uh, his father was one of those patients and he died in the, in the nursing home um, and he was never able to visit at, in those dying days. So, well, you know, three years later, we can look back on those times. And um, I, I know that as someone who specializes in brain cancer, our patients need you more than ever. And I think that we really are, when we make these diagnoses and we and we devastate families with these diagnoses, mm -hmm. um, having you out there is a real gift. And so uh, we're just grateful that that you're persevering and, and providing a life for our patients. I know you had a lot of darkness and now you're a bright shining light for our patients. So thank you. I appreciate that. It's um, it's really humbling work. You know, it's it wasn't something that I set out to do to be super popular or to gain tons of followers or to make a boatload of money, but things just kind of started to fall into place on their own. And even some of the sponsors that I work with, they're the most amazing individuals and the partners that I've met and, you know, teaming up with, with you guys at Northwell and you just, I ended up meeting people I never expected that I would meet and got a chance to touch lives of people all over the globe. And, and now I do, I volunteer as a patient advocate and I go to hospitals and I do virtual calls with patients and families and I help connect them to clinical trials and I walk them through, you know, what they're going through. They sign a form, they share the information with me and then I get them, you know, and I've, I know I've referred a few people to you. Um, I've reached out and I've said, Hey, I've got a patient I'm working with. And it's I, I have one right now that she just got into a clinical trial that her doctor never even told her about. And I went and I sat down and I met with her and her family. And she we reached out to the principal investigator. They went through everything. They connected her with the coordinator. And the next thing you know, she's in the trial. That's fantastic. And um, that kind of stuff is really rewarding for me. And I, I I'd like to think that Mike would be really proud of what I'm doing in his memory and in his honor. And if it helps even one person that can say, you know, I feel energized or I feel uplifted by what you've said or by your, the guest that was just on your show or your thoughts, then then I'm doing what the universe is asking me to do right now. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, just your experience and if there are new patients, new caregivers who are watching your podcast and how do you, you know, you're like a life coach now. You're, a, you're almost... Um, you're a coach and what's the hardest part of obviously the hard part is getting the diagnosis, but what are your recommendations to newly diagnosed patients? How do they navigate this complex process in their inbox? They're hearing stories of <laughs> such and such treatment. And do they go mm -hmm. to Germany for a vaccine? Do they wear this electric cap? Do they do this? Do they see so-and-so? Mm -hmm. What do you, I mean, without getting too, um, Complex. granular yeah <laughs> how do patients navigate this you know it's easy for me i'm sort of behind a, a door somewhere but mm -hmm. gosh getting that that news is just so traumatizing i think the first step is honestly to let it soak in um the first few days when you get the when you get the initial diagnosis and and then you have to have the surgery and then I mean, everything is just immediate, especially in the brain cancer world. It, it's just bam, 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 bam. We're not wasting time. It's surgery. It's radiation. It's this. We're going to go, go, go. And you really do feel like your head is spinning out of control. I mean, you, you, you have no time to digest. And the most important thing is to really honestly, to be able to sit down, especially if it's, if it's a spouse or if it's your child and you and your spouse are dealing with the child being diagnosed, um, you know, if it's an elderly parent, to be able to sit down as a family or as partners and say, okay, we need to take in what the information that we just got about you or about me and how we want to go about handling this and trying to navigate it as a team, you know, as partners. There was never anything that came through email or that got sent to me that I didn't turn around and say to Mike, okay, this is what I'm reading. What are your thoughts about this? What do you, you know, what's your gut telling you? This is what I'm learning. And we really went through it all together. And you can't, there, there's just no way to say, this is going to be the best thing that's going to work, or this is going to provide us 
the answer that we're looking for. And we did the same thing. You know, we'll, we'll go to Germany. We'll go here. We'll spend whatever money we have to spend. We'll sell the house if we have to. You know, we'll do what we have to do to, to get him as far as we can get him. And I think that's the initial trigger reaction that everybody wants to have. And when you take a step back, the best thing you can do is quiet the noise, siphon through the information that you have. So if somebody is giving you information about Optune or about Cervaxm or another clinical trial, and then try to reach out to individuals that have, you know, like a patient advocate or resource information, somebody else who may have been using that technology or gone through that clinical trial to get information about what it was like or what the process is. And then you have to trust your gut. I mean, honestly, that's... You can read information all day long. And at the end of the day, you don't know what what works for one person may not work for the next, you know, or, you know, I mean, you could go on a diet that, you know, I mean, diet nutrition is a big thing in brain cancer. And some, some of these diets are like the keto diet is really working for some patients, but for others, it's not. So you have to trust your gut and go with what you think could be best for you or your family. And and that's that's the hardest thing because sometimes you feel like you can't trust your gut or you're not sure if you're going to make the right decision, but you don't know what decision is going to be the right decision uh, until you do it. So it's it's easy to think that people um, have access to resources, right? Um, but there are a lot of people who don't have access to even simple things like the internet and and Google. Mm-hmm. Of course, health insurance, which is another whole topic on its own. Yeah. So, how do we do better um, just in, in spreading the word and giving resources to those who are underserved and obviously without those mm-hmm. those privileges? You know, I think the biggest. I mean, it it really starts at surgery. You know, when these people come in, if they're in underserved communities or they're living out in rural populations their first point of contact is not the internet. Their first point of contact is their surgeons, their oncologists, the radiologist teams, their care coordinators that are planning with them. And the best thing that we can do on the other side of this is make sure that they have any up-to-date information when they walk out that door and get ready to plan, uh, especially as they're heading into radiation. And and there is that sweet spot, you know, before somebody goes into surgery, there are some clinical trials right now that are supposed to be done at the time of surgery. How do patients know about that? Well, the only way they're going to know is the minute they're diagnosed, doctors and, and oncologists being able to say, okay, here are some options that we can offer you as you go into surgery or during that gap between surgery and radiation, um, you know, or at the start of radiation, if there's clinical mm-hmm. trials that coincide with that. It's disseminating the information to them right there um, in real time, especially if they don't have access to the internet. Um, and even when they do, um, you know, it's making sure they know that these are the resources that are available that you can listen to or or look up information on. Will help you just dis- you know cipher through that. But we need more. We need more patient advocates. I mean, we really need more people that can sit there and, and walk through with the patients. Um, in real time as they're going through it, because I think that's the only way they're going to get it, especially if they're in rural populations. It's it's point of contact, and it all comes down to point of contact, and we have to get them that information right away and not wait until after they start the process and then they've missed the window for something. So uh, besides yourself, what are some other good um, organizations that you work with that can provide you know, outreach or resources, or let's say you're on the West Coast, you're in Buffalo, you're occupied. Give me, you know, some of your colleagues. You know, we've got some amazing, um, you know, we've got Kim's Hope is an amazing foundation um, that has some really great resource information. Um, The Outlier Fund, which is down in Pennsylvania, and Fierce Foundation, which is also in Pennsylvania, um, they offer some really great resource information. And the Fierce Foundation actually has grants that they give to patients and families and caregivers. So you can apply for one of their grants to help offset certain financial burdens. 
And I think that that's a really amazing opportunity that patients and families can can kind of jump on to help alleviate some of that financial strain. Um, the Ivy Brain Tumor Center out west has got some really great resources, and they tell a lot of patient stories. Um, they do a lot of phase zero clinical trials, which are really important. Um, and we have Cure Brain Cancer Foundation, which is now making their way into the U.S. They're doing a lot more with brain cancer, and there he's. Lance Kawaguchi is doing uh, the South Pole Trek to raise funds for brain cancer, specifically in the U.S. And so they're building a team here in the U.S. that I've been partnered with. And so there really are some great resources out there. It's just a matter of being able to to siphon through. And and there, when there's so much coming at you, it's nice to have somebody that can help you walk through that. That's not part of the clinical team, um, but. There are definitely, and there's more out there now than there was when my husband was diagnosed just four years ago. So I do agree with that. And obviously having the benefit of being in media and seeing the proliferation of social media and the community of brain cancer, even in the last five years, um, with your help and our shows and our socials, mm -hmm. I do feel like the family is out there and we get touches mm -hmm. all day long. I'm sure you do also. And so the reach of social media, this is one of the good things about, you know, Instagram and TikTok and, mm -hmm. and Netflix and all. The and other. you guys are doing, I mean, one of my counterpart, Danielle Kasucci, who is one of the partners at Mimivac, she was just down yeah. at your facility at Lenox Hill. Yeah. You know, you guys are doing the Cervaxm clinical trial yeah. and, you know, you guys are posting about it and you're showing pictures of the yeah. patients that are getting it. And all of that, is so crucial yeah. um, to the work that they're doing. Yeah. And I think we're, you know, I have to, I remind every patient, I don't make a cent from any surgery, any trial. We're not incentivized by clinical research. Um, we're academically and personally and professionally motivated to really move the needle. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a great resource for us. Yeah. <clears throat> Talk a little bit about, if you can, some of the, you mentioned the financial impact on some of these families and it obviously there's physical, emotional, psychological, and there's nothing worse than having all that in conjunction with financial ruin essentially. Mm -hmm. And so are there things you suggest uh, for families? And obviously you mentioned uh, one of them, but how do you navigate that? So, yeah, it's, um, having financial stress and financial burden is it really takes a massive toll and the costs become outrageous we we actually had a patient that we were working with recently who is a retired military vet and some of their insurance coverage didn't want to cover some of the stuff for the cervax um, clinical trial that they got accepted into and so there was a lot of back and forth and figuring out what other insurance they have they don't have to pay for cervax and that's already covered how do we get this? I mean, and it becomes such a, such a, and, you know, when you're looking at like hiring a dietitian or getting on a nutrition plan, that's a separate cost that insurance doesn't cover. So what I can say is that there are a lot of grant resources out there. I know the ABTA, the American Brain Tumor Association, they offer some financial aid and, and grant assistance, or they'll give resource lists. Um, the Fierce Foundation obviously is another one. I always tell people to, you know, never hesitate to start a fundraiser, never hesitate to, to do a GoFundMe campaign. This is one of those times where it's okay to put your pride aside and ask for help because the community will rally. And even though my husband and I were in an okay place, his office still wanted to put a fundraiser together and GoFundMe to raise funds to help us with the financial costs of the treatments and what we were going through. And we fought it for quite a while because of our pride. And then eventually we gave in and when we showed up, there were over 400 people at the fundraiser and it, uh, it touched us a great deal and they raised a lot of money and we were shocked. Um, and it helped, it helped out even though we weren't in a place where we were desperate. Um, it also showed us how many people cared. And I think that's what community is all about. People want to rally around you and they want to help support you the best they can. So, you know, there are so many creative ways to try to to gather money and to host fundraisers and to show support for somebody who might be in need. And if you are that person in need, doing a GoFundMe campaign 
it never, it never hurts to just say, you know what, this is the situation we're in. It's hard times and we need some help. I think uh, Zoom is giving me five more minutes or else I have to pay for an upgrade. <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, I love it. So we have five minutes left. I want to allow you to sort of close out. Um, you know, I just want to, first of all, thank you again for giving me the opportunity to get emotional with you. And um, I, I can tell you, we get emotional a lot in the office and um, it's because we're dealing with a very emotional disease and population mm -hmm. and we're just emotional people. But, um, you know, obviously you went through something very tragic, but came out really as a stoic leader in our field. And um, we're, we're eternally grateful for that and for your um, voice. Um, but what is the next, you know, three to five years look for you and, and for expanding this concept and i don't i you don't have to scale anything but how do you want to scale what your success has been oh honestly um right now i really take one year at a time um if i've learned anything through this journey it's that uh, planning it's too hard to plan too far ahead because life has its own ideas um my biggest thing right now is focusing on getting season four launched and continuing to grow. I want to try to reach more people. And um, I, I love doing the patient advocacy, the one-on-ones and uh, public speaking. So I'm trying to grow that. And we're also doing, uh, we've got some new ideas with the podcast. There's some spinoff things that we want to do that we haven't disclosed yet. But we have some ideas to kind of grow the storytelling aspect of the work that we're doing with the reach we have and continuing to build those partnerships with neurologists and oncologists. And personally, you know, if I can keep doing that and finding a way to make a difference in storytelling, um, which is something that I'm super passionate about and always have been, then, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep stay focused kind of on that, on that train and on that journey. And personally just kind of allow myself to keep healing and, I'm trying to learn how to listen to my gut again and, and trust the signs that I might be seeing. And, um, but you know, I, right now it's just me and my dog and <laughs> I take care of her and I, I cycle and I work out and, um, and I get to work with some amazing individuals. So I just, I try to stay focused on that. Um, and we'll see where it goes. You know, it's three to five years. I have no idea. I have no idea what, what life will look like. And, I think I'm okay with not knowing right now because I had a plan and I had a whole idea of how life was going to look. And with that ripped away, I think right now I need to be okay with not knowing and just letting the universe take me where it feels I need to be going. So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm just kind of riding this through and then whatever opportunities come up, we'll, we'll go with it. We'll go from there. Well, take us along with you for the ride. Always. <laughs> Always. Um, Shannon Trapagan, um, you're really an inspiration. And um, you. you're such a pleasure to work with. And thank you again from all of us for the Game on Glio podcast. It's really now what we need is, you know, <clears throat> it, uh, as an app on our the, our patients' phones, that's a constant mm -hmm. navigation and reminder and chat function and personal assistant and psychotherapist and everything else. Just that's that's next. Yeah, we're working on some things with that too. <laughs> well, yeah. Before we close, I just want to thank you again and um, look forward to working with you in the future and hope to see you soon. Absolutely. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. And um, anybody who wants to jump on, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Game on Glio is everywhere. Um, they can find us real easily and, and reach out if they need help. And I'll absolutely direct message them. And, and if I can help, if they have a family member who's diagnosed, I'll absolutely do what I can. An award-winning podcast. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I just won the Ignite Award. And yeah, so we're, it's, it's amazing. I'm really proud of the work we're doing. I have an amazing team. Congratulations. Thank you. Talk to you soon. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.